Hello, I'm Professor Claire Rusbridge. Welcome to my YouTube channel. And in today's video, we're going to talk about how to interpret bony spurs on vertebrae. These are called various names according to their various conditions, such as vertebral osteophytosis, which is the correct name, a bony exotosis. Um, but more commonly, people will refer to it as spondylosis, spondylosis deformans, spondylitis, discospondylitis, and uh, uh, diffuse idiopathic skeletal hyperostosis. A lot of names and a lot of confusion. And because bony spurs are very easy to identify on radiographs, and the first step that a general practitioner will often do in investigating spinal disease in a dog or cat is take a radiograph, then these bony spurs are often identified and pointed out to the owners, but they're also often overinterpreted. And that's what this video is going to try and address. So vertebral osteophytosis, or bony spurs between the vertebrae, is it pathology or is it just an incidental finding? So we're going to talk about three different types of spinal exotosis. Um, that, that is spondylosis deformans, disseminated idiopathic skeletal, or some people say spinal uh, hyperostosis. This is often referred to as DISH, much easier to say. And in humans uh, is referred to as ankylosing hyperostosis. So you may see that term occasionally used. And we're also going to call talk about discospondylitis and we're going to give a mention to spondylitis. So spondylosis deformans or vertebral osteophytosis is where you get these bony spurs or osteophytes that um, start to bridge over the intervertebral disc and they typically are ventrally as indicated by these um, yellow arrows. They're associated with degeneration of the annulus fibrosis. So that degeneration will occur with age. It's more likely in larger dogs. There is an inherited tendency towards it. You will see it in, in some breeds over, uh, over others. For example, you're much more likely to see it in German Shepherd dogs and you're much le less likely to see it in standard poodles. And it's also related to mechanical uh, stress. Um, so, for example, if there is increased uh, mobility over or stress or strain on one particular vertebrae, then you may be more likely to see it. In, fa in fact, you are more likely to see it at places in the vertebral body, um, in the, sorry, in the, um, in the spinal column, which are under greater mechanical stress. What is the purpose of it? It is simply a, a, a means of re-establishing stability. So the uh, the disc and the end plate are important for stabilizing the spine. If that has increased uh, mobility or degeneration, then the body's response to that is to put this um, protective bony spur going between the vertebrae to re-establish that stability. So it's most common in areas with increased movements. It's more common in the mid-thoracic, the cranial lumbar and the lumbar sacral region. And it's really common in old dogs. There was a study that looked at, um, um, I think it's over 2000 dogs of any age, any breed, and they found 18% of those dogs had um, uh, some spondylosis and that rises to about 75% in some populations. So this means if you take a radiograph of an old large breed dog, you're pretty likely to see it. And, um, and therefore it's very important that you don't overinterpret um, that rather easy to spot a change on a radiograph because it does not result in clinical signs in the majority of dogs. It might be associated with a chronic disc disease, either a protrusion or an extrusion. Um, it, it has to be quite chronic because it's associated with degeneration of the annulus fibrosis and, uh, and that sort of changes stability of the disc. And so it doesn't take, you know, this sort of bony spur doesn't occur immediately. So you are very unlikely to see it with an acute disc extrusion, unless that's acute on chronic. So it's got to have been established for a while. So what exactly do they look like? Um, this is an image that I've taken from uh, this paper here, 
um, which is an open access paper which actually looked at um, this change as an indicator of mechanical stress, transport uh, um, activities in archaeological dogs. Uh, actually, interestingly, their conclusion was that uh, you couldn't take this as a indication of mechanical stress just because it's so common in the dog population whether or not they are transporting uh, goods or not. Um, so the, it's normally graded uh, uh, spondylosis deformans from um, very small spurs, as you can see here. This is the intervertebral um, space where the intervertebral disc would be. This is the vertebral end plate here. And we can just see these very small spurs occurring um, uh, to almost fused bridges. So you can just see that's almost fused across to these uh, really quite substantial bony bridges that are occurring um, both uh, ventrally uh, and laterally. I have to say in this particular, though this is in a paper of spondylosis deformans, I actually wonder whether this is the um, uh, has many features that are more typical of dish in this uh, in this particular image, and the way I describe it is it's like a tree. This is a tree that was given to me for my last birthday. I'm particularly fond of it. It's a rowan tree, which is a tree native to Scotland, where I, um, uh, although I don't sound like it, originated from. Um, and we can see with this tree, I've protected it by giving it a stake. And this is because in high winds, this tree will go backwards and forwards and it will become damaged. So I need to give it a little bit of increased stability by the stake. And that's what these spurs are doing, just a little bit of increased stability. Some people wonder if it's pinching on a nerve, but look, no, there are the foramen in this particular thing. And this is how the nerve is coming out. So having something down on the bottom of the vertebrae here is not going to interfere with that nerve coming out. So it's not going to give a pinched nerve unless that goes all the way up and covers this region. But even if it's lateral here, it's not going to, um, to affect that nerve in the vast majority of cases. Yes, there are some exceptions which we're going to talk about. So the, the, the thing that you need to know is how to tell that this is spondylosis deformans so you can inform your owners. So my, the first question is, does the bony spur attend, extend from vertebral end plate, the epiphysis, to vertebral end plate? Is the mid part of the vertebral body unaffected? So you see here, even in this one where there's two bridges, the mid part is unaffected. So it's literally going from end plate to end plate to stabilize that disc area. And on MRI scan, if you're lucky enough to be using that, is it hypo intense on T2 weighted and T1 weighted consistent with a tissue that has a low water content? So we can see this great big spondylosis here and we can see that there is um, uh, very little signal in it because it has got a low water content and the same here. Um, just to point out some of the other features in here, you can see that this, these um, uh, uh, areas of spondylosis here are associated with some type two, Hansen type two disc protrusions, chronic disc protrusions or annular protrusions. Um, uh, if you're unclear what I mean by that, then I would suggest the, the video that is the first in this series on types of disc extrusion. These are, are non-significant disc protrusions. Yes, there is some, um, some elevation of the dorsal longitudinal ligament, which we can see along here, but there is not spinal cord compression. That is uh, in comparison to this very large type 2 um, Hansen uh, um, disc protrusion or chronic disc protrusion where we can see there is a significant bulge and compression of the corda equina here especially against what is quite a, a thickened ligamentum flavum on the top but the presence of spondylosis there is not helping us tell that that pathology is is going on um, because um, one could equally focus on these areas of spondylosis where this is clinically irrelevant is this spondylitis? No, it's not. Spondylitis, you often read it in, in veterinary records, at least I do, because I, I get sent uh, cases for a second opinion. But spondylitis means inflammation of the vertebrae. And uh, it's, it's really not helpful to use this term as a diagnosis for dogs with back pain 
or whether radiographs actually are revealing spondylosis deformance. Yeah, I realised all the names are a bit confusing. So here's a definition. The spondyle is the name for the vertebrae. It comes from Old French, um, but old, um, originally Latin or, or Greek, uh, spondylus uh, and spondylose. Um, a spondylo means a joint uh, joining two of two pieces. Uh, usually, however, uh, the vertebrae, unless it's very old language. Spondylitis means inflammation of the vertebrae, and because the vertebrae just doesn't spontaneously inflame, it's usually a, an infectious or always an infectious origin. Discospondylitis is inflammation of the disc and the vertebrae, and that's typically infectious origin, um, uh, uh, always infectious origin. And spondylolisthesis is a ver ventral slippage of one vertebrae compared to another, with lithitis mean uh, slippage. Not a common diagnosis in dogs and cats, but does occur. So please bear in mind that spondyl uh, spondylosis deformance is an observation on a radiograph, not a diagnosis. So that would be like saying the dog has anemia. Anemia isn't a diagnosis, it's a clinical um, finding. Uh, you need to determine what is the cause. And in the case of spondylosis deformance, uh, it's, uh, uh, it may be a completely incidental finding. So is it clinically relevant? Well, first of all, does the dog have spinal pain specifically in this area? And is the intervertebral disc space normal? And again, I ask you, is a tree with a stake um, for support abnormal? No, it's just a weak tree that needs to have uh, a little bit of uh, increased support. So my question to you is which dog out of these two has clinically significant lumbar sacral disc disease? Is it this dog? Fair amount of spondylosis here, but or compared to this dog, much more spondylosis here, almost a complete, a complete bridge. And then we got a little bit going on here. Which one is it? Giving you a few moments here to make your assessment. Well, radiographs and the presence of spondylosis are very unreliable for detecting spinal disease. Um, but obviously that is the route by which most vets are able to make some kind of assessment. So the first thing is to look at the intervertebral disc space. And in this dog, this intervertebral disc space is very similar to this intervertebral disc space and this one. Bearing in mind these are slightly rotated, so you're seeing the back end of, of the end plate there and there. This one is perfectly straight. So this is a normal size intervertebral disc space, so it's difficult to imagine that this is popping up here, despite the amount of spondylosis that is there. Whereas this one is definitely collapsed in comparison to this space here. This is the line of the vertebral end plate here and here. The little bit behind is, is just the end plate from the uh, most, uh, the side that's furthest away from the x-ray machine. So this is a much more significant um, uh, change we can also look at the end plates and we see that, uh, and the end plates, these are much more sclerotic. Can you see all the white here? And compare it to this here, not nearly so much white. So all of this change of the scler sclerosis is, is an attempt to the body to try to, to improve strength in that region, um, whereas this uh, here is more normal. So, and actual fact, despite the amount of, uh, of spondylosis there, it is this dog that had the significant disc disease and this dog that was um, uh, uh, completely asymptomatic, um, if we're allowed to use that term in, in veterinary medicine, without clinical signs. Um, so this is the one that is significant. And really the reason for bringing this up is to, to highlight how it's important not to overinterpret how much spondylosis there is and to take it um, alongside many other radiographic signs that might not be quite so obvious. The next condition we're going to talk about is disseminated idiopathic skeletal, or some people refer to spinal 
hyperostosis. And this is um, a, a very dramatic condition when you see it on radiographs. Um, it is calcification and ossification below, usually, the ventral uh, longitudinal ligament. Some people say it's of the ventral longitudinal ligament. That would be logical given the, the location, but there have been some pathological studies which have shown that ligament is still present through it. So you get this amazing amount of bone flowing between the vertebrae, as we can see very dramatically here on this uh, CT scan. And to make an, an absolute diagnosis, it's meant to be at least four contiguous vertebral bodies. That is the classic diagnosis. But I have to say that uh, in my experience, I will occasionally come off, uh, across dish-like lesions um, between only two vertebrae or maybe even one vertebrae, and I'm going to show you one of those. So I think actually uh, in this disorder, there are quite a few different variations between quite mildly affected and more severely affected. But we have to also bear in mind this is a progressive disorder. So when you take your radiograph, you may not see, be seeing the full extent. And in some uh, animals, there may be appendicular skeleton uh, changes. So you'll see osteophytes over the joint margins um, and, uh, um, and bone, bony change of the ligaments and tendon insertion sites, which is called enthesiosphytes. Um, you importantly, for making a diagnosis of this, you have preservation of the intervertebral disc um, uh, space and width between the vertebrae. So look at these here. Absolutely no collapse whatsoever. And there is no sclerosis of these uh, vertebral end plates, no changes at all, no evidence that, that there is any disc degeneration here. I'd like to point out the difference here. There is some sclerosis of the end plate here. We're going to come back to it and here. And can you just see that there is some different type of bony change right here? So we're going to come back and come back to that. That's just to illustrate the, the, the difference. There also may be dorsal vertebral column changes. So periarticular new bone formation at the articular facets, uh, pseudoarthrosis between the spinous processes and possibly th uh, thickening of the dorsal lamina, the dorsal lamina being this little bit here. It occurs with a prevalence of about 3.8% um, in clinically normal dogs. And it's very common in boxers. So much so that if you take a radiograph of a boxer, you're pretty likely to find it. And it is very, very rarely associated with uh, clinical signs. In fact, I can't think of a single case in my 30 years as a veterinary neurologist where I actually found the dish being associated with clinical signs. There was one boxer that I thought it was, but then that boxer, because the boxer was presenting with stiffness, lameness, gait changes and pain, but actually it turned out to have polymyositis, so um, uh, uh, not. Occasionally, because um, you get some uh, decreased bone density in that region, because the whole area is just rigid, so um, the, uh, the bone uh, becomes a little bit osteopenic, uh, it may predispose the dog to fractures after minor trauma, and that's certainly reported in the literature, but I have never seen it. Um, so, uh, again, be very cautious at over in, in interpreting uh, that change. So, question, is it uh, disseminated idiopathic skeletal hyperostosis or DISH? Um, well, first of all, does the bony spur extend um, from uh, the mid body? So we have here, as, you say, as, as distinct from the other one, you can see that it's extending from mid vertebrae to mid vertebrae, as opposed to last time where we could, we, uh, in the spondylosis deformers, we saw it extending from end plate to end plate. Is there any evidence of disc disease? No, there shouldn't be in dish. So there is the disc spaces are normal and there's no end plate um, uh, uh, sclerosis. And then maybe is there dorsal compartment involvement? So you can see here, um, this is sometimes referred to as kissing spines, but there's a pseudoarthrosis between the spinous processes. And look at, uh, at the um, joint 
area here we can see all this sort of new bone but this isn't arthritis because look there's no collapse of those um, articular facet spaces it's just new bone forming on that um, on that region if you're looking at CT then does the bony bridge have the signal for normal bone with bone marrow so you get this hyper intense this is this is the same dog um, we have the bony bridge going from here and on the MRI T2 weighted that we have a hyper intense signal inside this bony bridge because it contains bone marrow this is the signal from fat now um, we I t told you to remember about this space here it's very unusual in fact I've never seen it for dish to involve the lumbar sacral junction it's typically flowing um, between all of the lumbar vertebrae or just um, four uh, lumbar vertebrae or more uh, but it doesn't involve L7 so if you take this whole segment and completely fuse it it creates a lot of mechanical stress on that lumbar sacral joint um, and as a result this dog and the, these little spurs here this is spondylosis deformans as a result of changes degeneration of the annulus fibrosis and the dog has a big uh, lumbar sacral disc protrusion chronic lumbar sacral disc protrusion which you can actually just see on the CT if I can draw this here just there so uh, it's a very good example of how your eye is drawn to the dramaticness of this this change here but actually the pathology is next to it so the main problem with dish is not the dish itself but the strain that it puts on the normal vertebrae um, and uh, you should so if you're seeing this change here and the dog is presenting with back pain it's the segment next to the uh, change that you need to be most worried about so those fused segments cause adjacent segment disease at the adjacent unfused intervertebral um, disc space especially the L7 S1 as I said before osteophyte formations that are extending dorsolaterally say at the blue arrow here can compress the spinal nerve roots uh, as they come out of the intervertebral foramen I mean I sort of tried to draw the intervertebral foramen in the last vertebra in the last x-ray in this lecture this time I've taken the advantage of drawing it in advance for you so you can see the uh, intervertebral foramen here and we can see it here but we can see there's a big bulge here so in this radiograph we have to worry is this lateral bridge significant in this dog what do we do well of course we never just take one spinal radiograph we always take um, uh, 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 the opposing view and in actual fact this bridge is going between the two vertebral bodies it's very unlikely that it's involving the foramen um, but perhaps if we, we know this is the thoracolumbar uh, junction area it's L1 L2 pretty ide easy to identify that area on the actual dog um, we know that it's the left side because we put a marker here so if we squeeze the apaxial muscles in that area is the dog really painful well that might give you a clue but really to prove that there's nerve root impingement on this side we need to have advanced diagnostic imaging so the next cause of um, spondylosis or bony spurs that we see is discospondylitis this is infection of the intervertebral disc and the adjacent vertebral um, bodies um, and this is distinguished from vertebral osteomyelitis which is just infection of the vertebrae and um, vertebral fasciitis which is infection um, centered on the uh, uh, on the growth plate with no initial uh, involvement of the disc space I'm pointing to this but actually it's um, uh, not a, a growing dog um, this is uh, uh, both examples of uh, discospondylitis uh, which shows varying degrees of the disease this is very chronic lumbar sacral involvement which is uh, most typical in large breed dogs um, we can see that we have um, spondylosis here there's probably an old age change uh, um, 
that predated the infection in this in this dog because we can see some rough areas here and we can see a real roughness to the end plate if you're struggling to see that I do have this one in, in it that's bigger in a later slide this dog however is a very very early discospondylitis and you would be uh, forgiven I think just about for thinking that this dog had intervertebral disc disease because when we look at the um, uh, uh, that is just a, an extrusion rather than uh, an infection. When we look at this, we can see that this is the normal size intervertebral disc, disc space, whereas this is collapsed. But look, look at the end plate. And look at that tiny little hole that's there and another hole there. You shouldn't see lysis in straightforward intervertebral disc disease with an extrusion. So the presence of lysis and extreme pain is what uh, uh, clues you into this is discospondylitis. Uh, most uh, uh, important predisposing cause, causes to be aware of, canine brucellosis, um, uh, if you're in the right area or if the dog is imported, grass seeds that migrate, so dogs inhale these grass seeds perhaps, especially if they're brachycephalic dogs who have to walk around with their mouth open because they cannot breathe through their noses. They can inhale them, goes to the bottom of the lungs, and then uh, migrates to this uh, L1, L2 region. This was a Springer Spaniel, actually, um, uh, which uh, is also a dog which is very good at running around and, and with their mouth open, inhaling grass seed. So it was certainly one of the possible causes in this dog. And if you're in an area which is hot and humid and predisposed to aspergillosis, um, such as Rick uh, 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 Malik, who gave me this slide uh, in Australia, then um, consider uh, aspergillosis. And this, this is easiest diagnosed by st this quick staining of the urine. D discospondylitis is a whole subject in itself, and we're not going to spend a lot of time on it here. It's really just to point out the differences between this and uh, spondylosis. And also um, really to make the point that um, what does spondylitis uh, mean? It means inflammation of the vertebrae that is uh, due to an infectious cause. And so actually, if we're going to ever use the term spondylitis, then that's what we need, mean. Um, so in this case, which is a, a vertebral osteomyelitis or fissitis more correctly, because the infection is around the growth plate in this one year old French bulldog that was presenting with lumbar sacral pain and, and lameness, um, uh, this is a particular um, uh, uh, predisposition site uh, in, uh, in young breed dogs as well. And we don't know why they get an infection here, um, but it's thought to relate to a systemic infection that uh, um, is manages to, to um, lodge out in this area with a poorer blood supply. That's what I was always told, but, I, but I, I'm not sure that that really rings true. Um, in, in my mind. So fasciitis inflammation around the growth plates. Um, spondylitis would not be incorrect here, but it's not really the word that we'd use. We'd more commonly say uh, vertebral osteomyelitis or, or fasciitis. So the question is, is it discospondylitis? Is the dog incredibly painful? I would say that discospondylitis is 10 out of 10 pain. So not just a, not the dog that's just you know, having difficulty standing up um, or a, a, a dog with mild lameness. We're talking about a dog that does not want to move. They're just standing there shaking. They're in so much pain. Um, is the origin of the dog from Eastern Europe? So is it, it, in UK, that would be a dog that would be rescued um, from the Eastern Europe. But unfortunately, also, it could be a puppy farm dog. Um, because uh, unfortunately dogs are being imported into our country pregnant um, so that they uh, have microchips that are coming from uh, the UK or they're sitting in stooge houses um, around the import zone, especially Kent. Um, uh, stooge houses, I, I mean, to just pretending that they are dogs that are, are household pets and the dam uh, is brought in heavily pregnant. Uh, gives birth. If the dam is infected with discus, uh, with uh, brucella, um, then uh, the puppies can be uh, uh, affected. And then, of course, the poor old dam gets shipped back to the puppy farm in, in Eastern Europe. So be very aware of that because um, it is a, 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 um, a real um, uh, problem um, for those imported dogs. 
The next question is, is there bony lysis? So when we look at the, this is the beautiful end plate in this dog here, but when we look at this, it's just a mess, basically. We cannot see that clean edge of that bone here or here. And um, uh, I've shown you previous examples of lumbar sacral disc disease, and, and they have not got that moth-eaten appearance. They have that thickened end plate. And are there changes to the intervertebral disc? So in here we can see that not only is the destruction of this intervertebral disc that's completely collapsed together. And the next thing is, is, do the osteophytes look rough? So I said before, this looks a little bit confusing because it's a very smooth uh, spondylosis deformance. And I think this is just because it's an older Labrador and it probably had that ever or pre-existing, then it got an infection in its disc and these osteophytes here are very rough uh, and, uh, and, uh, 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 and new. So this one's very old, long-standing. These are, are new associated with the intervertebral disc infection. So that's our conclusion to our journey through bony spurs. And the, uh, and the, the point is that bony spurs on vertebrae are very common. Um, easy to identify in the uh, um, radiograph, but mostly they are insignificant and you really need to take account of the dog's clinical signs and other changes that are going uh, on in those radiographs or consider referral for, for uh, further diagnostic imaging. I just wanted to throw this in here. This is a um, picture I took when I recently visited the Hunterian Museum. Um, which is a free museum uh, to visit in London, associated with the Royal College of Surgeons. Absolutely fa fabulous mu museum. I totally recommend it if you're visiting London. Um, they didn't know what was caused uh, all of this new bone formation or, or in the muscles on this cat, and it's also fused below. Um, but I suspect that this, this cat was given an all-liver diet, and this is hypervitaminosis A. Uh, quite rare nowadays unless you have uh, an owner that um, is uh, taking the whole raw diet to the next level and giving just a uh, liver. And uh, I'm going to end there. Thank you very much. Happy to answer any questions in the comments. So I hope that you've enjoyed this little journey through how to interpret bony spurs on vertebrae. My motivation for doing this is that it is so easy to spot these on radiographs and you feel like you need to point them out to owners. Um, but there's very little information for general veterinary surgeons on how to interpret them. So this was my motivation and I hope that it helped you. Bye bye.